Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our January 3rd Thursday. Um, we are fortunately have uh, Ben Min Chang joining us today for a scheduled um, talk on drone imaging, which we might get to today, yeah. but we're going to pivot and he's going to talk about um, uh, extreme cold events first, because I think that's what everybody wants to talk about. Um, Dr. Ben Min Chang is a researcher with the okay. Summerland okay. Research and Development Center. He's been there since March of 2022. Um, previously, he received his PhD degree and worked as a postdoctoral research associate at the associate at the Irrigated Agriculture Research and Extension Center in Prosser, Washington. Um, his work is specifically um, around managing cold heat and drought stress of wine grapes in the Okanagan Valley. So um, it's good to have you, Ben Min, and I'll let you, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Cassie, for the introduction. So, uh, I was asked, uh, initially I was asked to talk about the drone study actually initiated by Pat Bowen here. And I uh, basically took over her uh, position and also carry on uh, the, the work she was doing. Yeah, so, but, at, but today everyone knows what we have been through. That was a terrible event. Uh, that's also my first, first time experience about what is minus 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, I go cold air. So uh, so today, actually, the first thing I'm we're going to talk about the uh, overall cold snap event. So I will start start here. So I uh, kind of uh, get the historical data from the, the local uh, Summerland Research Center, uh, they, sorry, the, the weather station data in Summerland Research Center. Okay, that's, that's, that, uh, that station was actually installed or they start uh, recording the weather, weather in 1916. Uh, so that was the first record, kind of later that year. And uh, and uh, over here, this bar is actually showing all the years with uh, below minus 23 degrees Celsius events. Okay, so why this uh, this temperature is critical? Why I'm using uh, this temperature is because uh, for European wine grapes, which is uh, Vitis vinifera, right? So if the, the temperature went under uh, minus 23 degrees Celsius, that will cause like at least 50% of bud damage for most of varieties, and also start to causing uh, start to cause uh, xylem damage. Okay, so these are kind of like live and death things, right? Very important temperature for uh, vinifera here. So I'm just uh, using using this temperature as a threshold and try to find uh, which year actually the temperature went to those uh, those events. Okay, so uh, very interesting. Like, uh, actually, there was uh, tons of events uh, during the, when they started doing the records until uh, 1969. And uh, I bet I saw somewhere like a, during this year, like a uh, 69, uh, 68 event, actually they, uh, the free, they, uh, the temperature actually low enough to freeze the Okanagan Lake, something like that. Yeah, so it was pretty terrible, but uh, after that year, there wasn't any events like that until uh, 1990s, okay. And what happened in 90, that period is actually, that's the, I think that's a turning point for this industry, right? So in uh, 1989, actually, uh, I think the, the, I don't know if there's a federal government involved here. So there is a replanting program encourage people to replace uh, their hybrid grapes and uh, start to grow more uh, vinifera grapes. So that's actually, the movement actually started in uh, 1989. And uh, and uh, right after that, uh, the, the industry here we we started the BC BQA right, and basically what happened there was uh, we have a super young industry, the European wine grapes industry, and a kind of a dodged the bullet a little bit right. So I think that's the reason I 
when I talk to growers, uh, not many people mention about these events. So I guess that's the reason. So basically, we had a really good years until this year, right? So we had a, like a, in a 19, 1990 events, the temperature went to minus 27. And this year, we, we got a minus 26 in Summerland. I'm just using uh, Summerland as, as an example. Of course, for Kelowna people in the Northern or the Central Valley people, uh, I think they have to deal more frequently with this kind of temperature. Yeah, but uh, for overall the southern side, the southern Okanagan Valley, this is still kind of a rare event. Yeah. And uh, overall, I could basically input the, the 100 years data here. You can see uh, it, it is quite, it is, or I say, I should say, uh, it used to be super cold, right? At, at a certain years, like here, in the uh, 50s and uh, 68, the temperature actually went to minus 29 or minus even 30. So I think I'll just keep it that in mind. That's the potential, what kind of a low temperature we could actually get here. It's even though we are saying, OK, there is a global ch uh, climate change or global warming, but uh, it doesn't say it doesn't guarantee there won't be this kind of event happen in the future. Just the, the, the question is just the frequency. So over here, actually below this point, we actually, it's very hard to predict uh, when next similar event will happen. Okay. So basically for us, for the, for most of us, this is actually a new challenge. We never facing similar situation like since we start growing lots of our European wine grapes. And let's see, next page. Okay, now uh, I think uh, most of us still remember what happened last, uh, sorry, not last year, actually in 2022, that was uh, December 21st, uh, cold snap. And uh, after the event, everyone noticed how devastating that was, right? But uh, this year is actually even worse. So we can actually compare these uh, two temperature graph here. This is the uh, graph from the 2022 events, and this is the 2024. So just uh, uh, last week. Okay. So what happened here? The first thing you can notice actually the temperature decreasing rate is slightly different. The last, the, the previous event actually uh, the temperature decreased about. Like, uh, every hours the temperature de decrease a half degree, but this year the number is very close to uh, one degree. That means the cold air just like pouring into the valley some very very fast. Okay, and uh, the second thing is the of course the minimum temperature is very different. So last year in Summerland we 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 suffered from the minus twenty two uh, seven degrees Celsius events. But at least here, the, the minimum temperature record here was uh, minus 25.2. And uh, just even though the difference is just like a three degree Celsius difference, right? But uh, that could actually like further damage the xylem already. And the other bad news is actually the, the, the long exposure under the cold, cold, cold temperature. So previously only 42 hours, and that's under minus 18 degrees Celsius. But this year, basically we have an extra 12 hours, oh, sorry, uh, 15 hours under this range. So we could actually expect in there will be uh, much more damage, more, more extensive damage here. Okay. So we already talked, so talks about the what happened and uh, what exactly is a uh, cold damage here. Uh, I think uh, this photo could help uh, people to how to identify what is a uh, cold damage as well. So these are the buds uh, we collected uh, in a in a in a in a vineyard. But actually over here this photo we uh, use a freezer to freeze them. So this is not a collecting after the cold event. But uh, 
basically they they did a, exactly the same trick. They killed the bus. Okay, so what happens here is usually the primary bus they will freeze first. They have a really bad cold hardness level here. So for example, the ice will forming here and uh, the ice will grow like uh, gradually going to other places. For example, so, so most uh, usually the primary will freeze first and uh, the ice might grow in, into the secondary buds and also to the, to the tertiary buds. And uh, somehow uh, there's a mechanism or something, the ice uh, sometimes just being stopped here. So they couldn't, there's a, some kind of uh, compartmentation things happen, which that's still a mystery. What's the mechanism? We still don't really know. But it stopped the ice growing to hurting more tissues like a xylem or phloem. But of course, when the temperature really dropped to really, really low, the these barrier just couldn't bear that uh, ice grows. Eventually, ice will grow over here and, uh, and uh, damage the xylem. But that requires even lower temperature. Okay, so after the ice was freeze for frozen and uh, the ice, you, everyone knows they will expand. Eventually, they will crack or uh, burst the cell out. And uh, if uh, if the temperature rise back to over the freezing point, okay, now thaw everything in the cells. Every con cell contents will mix all together and start to develop the brown or dark color we are seeing here. And uh, over here, you can see to to be a reference. Here is a healthy healthy bus. We can see the structure really well in these uh, primary bus. We can actually see the internals, right? And I can see the secondary bus here and the tertiary bus here. The every uh, the detail of that structure is very clear in a healthy bus. But over here, you can see you pretty much couldn't identify any uh, detailed structure. Uh, over here. So this is the other way how to identify if the the, the bars are dead or not. Okay. So these the, the previous one was uh, was uh, that uh, cross section over that vertical uh, vertical face, but uh, this one is a horizontal cut, and uh, demonstrate you uh, how the color will look like. And the least way is actually most of people will dissect the plot uh, with this angle. So also here you can see the dark or very brown color dense tissues here compared to really clear. You can see the detail and the very green um, uh, green buds here. And uh, I will also mention about the the fruitfulness among these uh, these these uh, buds. So great buds is very interesting. We usually call the whole thing is a compound buds. And we see in the compound bus, you can find the primary bus, so the biggest bus, and the secondary, and also tertiary. So usually the primary bus will carry most of the clusters, and they will become the crop for the for the next season. But uh, sometimes also you can find some uh, clusters with the secondary bus, just like the graph shows you here. But uh, but uh, uh, during the cold event, usually these bus will be killed first. Right. So this is kind of a way we will say how the uh, the the cold damage will impact the next year's uh, crop because uh, the primary bot will be killed first, and of of course the the clusters went away with them. Okay. And uh, here these are the uh, the photos shows you the can or the trunk damage how they how they looks like. Okay, so the once again we're going to mention about the cold hardness level. This is just a general rule. So the phloem actually has better uh, cold hardness level than the prime primary bot, and the primary bot is fairly similar to the phloem. So these uh, two tissues or the organs are actually very susceptible susceptible to the cold temperature. Okay. And over here, you can see the flown damage showing here. That's uh, the brown color, might be a stripes types or just uh, underlying that bark tissues. You can see the brown area. That's the damaged, uh, damaged flown. And over the xylem, it's a, 
uh, relatively difficult to tell if the uh, if the the xylem is damaged or not because uh, it basically just looks a slightly pale than the healthy tissues here. Okay. And uh, the other thing worth to mention is uh, actually flow damage is uh, is uh, could be re reversible. So once the xylem is still alive, they can support the flow. And uh, flow damage, usually, we don't really have to worry about them once the xylem is uh, still alive. OK. But uh, xylem, they themselves, once they got damaged, they couldn't be repaired. And it's basically an irre irreversible process. And also, the xylem damage could be accumulated. So for example, we have a consecutive year and the xylem got damaged, we might suffer from like a, the first year we got a 50% damage, but the next year, even though we just lost another uh, maybe 20% of damage, but uh, cumulative altogether, we actually got a 70% of damage. And uh, this will will result in that kind of like a, a symptom like a, a blind collapsing. We are seeing in the hot day or in the hot summer because the water demand is so high, but the 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 the, the xylem, they they were damaged. Basically, they couldn't keep that defense up, so the vine will collapse. And uh, these uh, phenomena usually we don't really see in the early spring because the early spring the temperature is, is relatively cool, right? The water demand is okay. So uh, sometimes these symptoms have to show until the the temperature really getting getting hot hot. So this is kind of making another difficult like. A, for you to determine should you uh, replace or replanting, right? There's a very, you have to make a really hard decision. It's a basically a game board. And also we don't really know what's the percentage of the damage will actually uh, making that summer collapse. Still need more study. And uh, we actually already talked about lots of a cold hardiness, but uh, how we describe it. Okay, so here is uh, kind of like a, most of the cold hardiness lab will describe cold hardiness in these, uh, these uh, system. And uh, we describe that using a value called low temperature exosin. So that's uh, basically uh, says that the, the temperature will kill certain percentage of the buzz in that population. So for example, when we are doing the test, what we are actually doing is uh, put a bunch of the uh, many, many bots in the freezer and uh, slowly decreasing the air temperature in the freezer until, uh, until that temperature killed them. And uh, there is a mass uh, we can actually count how many bots are dead in that freezer. Okay, so for example, here, the temperature might start from minus three degrees Celsius and I go into here around uh, just uh, approaching to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And then now we are seeing the first buzz this, right? Okay, or, or maybe that's a 10% of buzz this. So the, the say that minus 19 degrees Celsius, that's called LT10 or LT10% actually. So that's the temperature which could kill 10% of the bus population. So like so on, and uh, the, the middle points when the temperature could kill 50% uh, of the bus, that's LT50. And uh, when the temperature further dropped to, here's probably like uh, minus 23 degrees Celsius, that's enough sufficient to kill 90% of the bus population. That will be LT90. So basically the idea is the lower the LT value is, Okay, the temperature, right? That's the temperature. And uh, that's, say, there's a better cold hardness. Okay, the lower the temperature, the better the uh, cold hardness. And uh, now we go back to see what actually happened in the in overall the valley. Um, the, I got this uh, information over the, there's a South Okanagan Viticulture Group in uh, Facebook. Uh, page, and that's a really useful. You can find a lots of uh, information, and I'm so happy to see the industry members and everyone in the valley. They are willing to share their 
uh, updated information with each other. That's a really good. I will say that's a part of the resilience uh, in the, in our industry. I'm really happy to see that. Yeah. So over here uh, on the left hand side, this table shows the uh, the LT50 number we got before the the cold event happened. So this is at the uh, when they are at the most cold hardness moment, what kind of a temperature they can bear. So overall, uh, if you average all these numbers together, they can uh, endure about minus 23 degrees Celsius of uh, uh, temperature. Of course, you might notice here are two hybrids here. They will probably uh, make these number look slightly better, but uh, just two variety here. So that's the difference is just minimal. Here. 0.2 or 0.3 degrees Celsius differences. But uh, all on the right hand side, the, these two columns here that describe the, the minimum temperature uh, in different places, they went in these two on these two dates. Okay, so basically over uh, after the first first night, first uh, cold uh, cold snap night, we already notice every number is lower than minus 23 degrees Celsius. Okay, so basically after the first night, we can pretty much know uh, at least 50% uh, damage will already be done. That's for sure. And uh, over here, that's the second night. And we see even lower temperature in certain places. All right. So that's double whammy. So the second day of a cold, and, uh, my expecting the, the damage will go way over, way below, oh, sorry, uh, way, way higher than 50% damage. And over here, uh, that's, that's still the same uh, temperature record, but uh, here uh, I basically uh, download the, the Xilinx damage temperature from Washington State University. Uh, that's because uh, over here, I haven't uh, include the Xilinx damage information. And uh, basically it is, uh, it's harder to identify that uh, temperature threshold. So we haven't really included this information, but uh, we can borrow their data. They're kind of six hour drive away from here. And uh, just have an idea what kind of temperature could actually harm the island and uh, potentially kill the truck. So uh, what we are seeing here, like in Cabinet Sauvignon, they can actually endure uh, 20, 25 degrees Celsius low temperature. And uh, this is uh, this is actually caused the 10% of the damage. I will say maybe uh, adding another two degrees Celsius lower, I will say that's a silence uh, LT50. Okay, that's just approximation. So even though you subtract that two degrees Celsius for many variety, you can still notice the temperature could cause uh, tremendous uh, damage. So just not only the bad damage that uh, we are already expecting, I'm also expecting maybe there will be an extensive uh, trunk damage as well. Just be aware. And then we wouldn't really know what's, what was going on until maybe in the spring when the bar break and we will see the collapsing or just like there's nothing bar break. And the other uh, pretty bad situation was the exposure time. So over here, we also measure the other thing. That's the, we are holding the temperature at a minus 18 degrees Celsius for about, uh, I think, uh, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, the buzz actually would, would get damaged during this uh, long-term exposure, even though this is way higher than those LT50 we described before, right? But actually, if you expose the bars, the tissues long enough, eventually uh, they will they will freeze. So for primary bars, uh, they can survive in in these uh, under this condition for just six hours. For secondary bars, they can survive for ten hours. But in reality, the overall uh, cold air duration was very very long. It's even long longer than la uh, previous cold snap, right? 
So in the valley, basically, there was uh, 57 hours of uh, uh, low temperature exposure, which is pretty devastating. So recall that like in summer land, the first night we got a minus 22 degrees Celsius, while our Malor was at uh, the LT50 was at uh, minus 22. So after the first night, I was actually expecting 50% of the damage. But uh, when I did a, a bot dissection, there's a no surviving bots. I think uh, partly that's just because the long exposure and uh, basically kill off the rest of the surviving bots. Okay, so we are talk talks about what happened. And uh, I think uh, I also have to mention about like what's the next step we want to do. So the sampling is important to know what the damage is, but uh, uh, I myself like I feel like I don't want to dissect in that many uh, bots or like, doing that many uh, trunk dissection. So this is uh, just a simple method will help you like determine how many samples you will need in uh, doing the bot dissection. Okay, so basically there some factor you need is the uh, you need to gather the minimum temperature and all all these uh, LT10, LT50, or LT90. Even though we don't, we currently haven't uh, provided the 90s or LT10. But uh, the rule of thumb is uh, if you uh, add about two degrees Celsius, that will be uh, LT10, and uh, minus two degrees Celsius, that will be LT90. That's uh, really rough uh, estimation but uh, sometimes it's useful and also we need to know the exposure time under uh, minus 18 degrees celsius and the other thing is how accurate the number you want if you just need a like a 10 percent error and you can actually uh, dramatically reduce your sample numbers but if you want to have a much more precise uh, estimation you have to increase your sampling numbers Okay, so for example, uh, if I know the minimum temperature could only cause about 10% of the damage, I could actually reduce the sampling number. If I, for example, here, I want to have a 5% uh, plus minus 5% of an error, and actually I just need a, about 150 uh, bars to finish one plot or the so-called uh, area of interest. But uh, if, uh, if I know the temperature actually getting really close to LT50 and I have to increase the, uh, uh, the sampling numbers. Okay, so rule of thumb is just go for 400 if you know the temperature went to somewhere close to LT50. But the other side, if you know the temperature goes way lower and uh, the damage level will, will be like a 90%, and then you can, again, go back to the last uh, sampling numbers. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a way I determine how many bots or how many cans I should collect in a vineyard. And also how to pick where you want. Basically, that's a question about the area of interest, right? So the first thing to think about it is uh, the wind and uh, the cold pocket. Do you have this kind of a terrain that will condensate a lot of a cold air there? Okay, but if there's that's a windy night, maybe you can ignore it because the wind will mix all those uh, cold air and warm air and then just make a homogeneous uh, air temperature in the vineyard. So if you have windy night and uh, you, you pretty much say you can do the random uh, selection in your whole plot, but if you know that was a really calm night, and they have a cold pocket, you know always that place is colder. Then you probably have to uh, separate those uh, zone out of from the rest of the areas and have a like a focused uh, sampling method in that region. Okay, and uh, in the past uh, few days, I kind of heard about people uh, talks about Vulcan. And uh, we do find a longer internals uh, have the association with the cold hardness of the bus. 
So, but uh, this is just a minimal effect. I'll, probably, well, I'll talk about that later. And uh, so, okay, here and over uh, over here, that's uh, after you do you did the sampling, you have to thaw the sample first. So just uh, leave the samples in room temperature uh, somewhere over uh, 20 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Just let the color develop. So that will be facilitate your identification of those uh, dead tissues. This is some like a tips if you are going to do about that section. So here is the uh, some this uh, some study about does just basically want to answer is the volcan actually less hardy. So what I found is actually the nose uh, diameter. Usually we say the volcanoes have a really thick. Uh, thick shoots, right, or thick knots. But actually, the knots diameter is not really sensitive at all. It, there's a no significant uh, significant correlation between the LT50 and the uh, knots diameter. But uh, over here, you sh I can show you here that's the uh, significant correlation. However, the correlate uh, the the coefficient of the correlation is very low. It can only explain like a 30% of the variation here. And also here, if I put the, compare the, the internals, the overall internals, nodes with a five centimeter internals with a 20 centimeter internal, what's the difference of their buds? So the difference is actually very minimal, just uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, differences. So why, I want to do this study. That's because after last time, the last uh, cold snap, I found uh, lots of uh, new buds or new shoots actually come from these uh, really basal buds or like really short internal section. So I was just thinking, well, maybe maybe uh, maybe the the thickness of the kin is actually doesn't really matter. That's the internal length matters. Okay. And uh, some, some maybe it's a good news. So the, the most of the rules are should be okay. They should be safe. We have a sensor at the depth at uh, 30 centimeters and uh, over here in Summerland. And uh, with a minimal snow cover, probably just like three inch to four inch uh, deep snow cover, but the, the soil temperature has never went below freezing point. And right now they're sitting at about uh, 0.7 degrees Celsius for a while already. And with the, the air temperature increasing, I'm thinking maybe maybe they wouldn't drop drop further. That would be great, right? But, but the cool thing about the, the snow is the, even though the snow definitely froze it, right? But uh, the soil surface temperature was actually pretty warm during those uh, cold, cold events. There's a uh, one day, that's uh, afternoon, I went to the vineyard and uh, just wipe out some snow and measure what's the uh, surface temperature. It's actually stayed at uh, 13 degrees Celsius. And so that basically means uh, if we can use that temperature during the cold event, maybe we can modify the air around the around the vine. So I'm trying to see if there's any uh, material we can cover the vine tissues or any part of vine we want to protect. Maybe the temperature is enough to save them, but we just have to need to find a really good and a cheap, uh, easy installation material to cover them. So that will be the kind of like a future study I would like to do. Yeah, so we start this uh, information, we can guess the most of uh, root fallen there will still survive. And uh, just other side notes, uh, usually to kill the root, we need a minus five degrees Celsius to kill the roots. Yeah, so th that's uh, some uh, information about the, uh, the cold damage in the past week. So I think uh, we should probably open the time for any question. Thanks, Benman. Um, Plenty of time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I get. I you know there's so many of us here. I think um, if you pop questions into the chat, I'll try and see them and and read them and pop them back to Benman. 
Um, mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, so uh, from from the charts, it looks like Osoyoos Upper Bench might be the only area that um, has uh, much hope. And I wonder if you've heard of anyone um, doing um, bud dissections in that area, or if any of our listeners have, have heard, if we have any info about that. Um, Ben, yeah, so we have, we went actually went to also use basically the overall South Okanagan Valley uh, yesterday and uh, yeah, so the recent couple of days. And I think uh, my technician just sent out the new report and it sounds like we barely got any signals. That means most of the bots are dead. Okay. Yeah, so for also use there's a no uh, leaving bus. Okay, and that's probably the time function, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are ah, the long exposure, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I, no, we do have questions here. Graham is asking about um, the relation to powdery mildew. So I'm assuming that this is about um, if there was already some powdery mildew stress um, or and or maybe it's about whether or not yeah. powdery mildew reacts to the cold. I, don't right. I did notice that was uh, my last year's experience. I, when I did a uh, can dissection or bus dissection, usually uh, the the can, you can see those uh, powdery mildew damage, right? With that symptom, and usually the all the cans are dead. So I think they have a certain capability to destroy their antifreeze mechanism. Basically, the, the mechanism that stopped the ice propagation, the ice growth mechanism. Yeah, so that's my hypothesis. So yeah, I think I think there is a association. Once there is a powder mildew and the, the cold hardness level just goes really high. The, so meaning- Really high means uh, the, more, they will be susceptible. Yeah. Right, because it's yeah. added, yeah, it's added stress, right? Yeah, right. Um, um, assuming 100% bud death, what are your thoughts on pruning strategies for this year? And uh, this year we also have to consider uh, the trunk damage. So, yeah, I people are asking that question. I'm still thinking about it. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but uh, if we basically take a bet, say, assuming the trunk are okay, and you still want to get the uh, get the uh, fruits, you probably want to leave as, ma as many buds as possible. Of course, that will increase your uh, the labor. If there's the, all the buds are actually viable and you have to pay extra time and the mm -hmm. labor in thinning, right? That's yeah. something to consider. But based on the temperature we see, I probably wouldn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, last Marcus Keller suggested last year um, in in um, vineyards with the greatest damage to postpone um, any pruning until right. after bud break. It's obviously not possible for most growers, but right. Um, do so? Do you have soil temperatures above thirty centimeters? Um, for example, fifteen centimeters below the ground. I think uh, we do, but I need to get the uh, get the data downloaded. Hmm. We have another type of sensor that measures uh, the temperature across from. I think the the first one will be fifteen centimeter and uh, down to ninety centimeter. Yeah, I can actually ask a bread my technician. But I mean, that's not helpful for grafted vines anyway, right? Uh, gravity vine, they probably will be protected by the snow, even though we know the snow is minimal this year, right? Right, the snow is deep enough to protect the graft. Uh, yeah, well, I, I will say the snow is probably the only thing that protects the yeah. Right? right? Yeah, now. too bad we didn't get yesterday's snowfall a week ago, right? Right. Um, Mike Watson is asking how you decided on minus 18 as the temperature for the study, for the long-term study. Mm, that's actually a question for Brad, but uh, 
I think that's a <laughs> temperature really close to the regular uh, killing temperature. But I, I don't know if uh, you can give a, that a bread answer that question or he can type in here. <laughs> so I, I'm guessing yeah. Mike is wondering whether like minus 15 for six hours would have the same effect. Yeah, I actually want to do the test like uh, over these uh, different different temperature, for example, holding at a minus yeah. a 15 and see how long we should be able to plot the correlation there. That would be super okay. useful. Now, basically, we have only two points. Okay. Um, okay. No more questions? I find that hard to believe. <laughs> What do, what do you think if a, if a vine is brought up from the roots, um, what's the, what would the yield expectation be in the second year? Oh, you mean if there's a roots damage or? No, if, if you're able to retrain from the roots oh, in 2024, retrain. then what could be expected from 2025? Wow, that's basically your kind of like a growing uh, new vine. Yeah, uh, if you retrain from really lower side. Yeah. So, so, so like it would be three years. Quite possible. Like I'm you know, probably three or four years until you reach to the the regular commercial right. yield. Yeah. Right. I mean, because a lot of the the question that needs to be weighed is whether to replant sooner than later, right? Like if you wait yeah. if you wait for a growing season and the vines collapse, um, you've right. lost a year, right? Um, we've got, oh, well, sorry. Brad has answered, uh, minus 18 was selected as it was typically above the LT10 value observed during the hardiness um, DTA sampling, i.e. a safe temperature. So, um, and then um, Karen has, is asking, what's, what's the point of hardiness sampling post extreme event if we don't surpass the current low, mm. right? Like I oh, guess the, that our DTA. Like yeah, I guess she's saying you know why why do we? I I mean you can't yeah. We yeah we could we could actually don't do it, but uh but uh, I'm observing some very interesting phenomena. Like for example, like last year we know they suffered from cold damage, but there are still some tissues still giving those signals. Right. So basically, we're keeping doing it, and uh, and eventually we'll realize why that ha that happened. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, and then the funny thing is, actually, last year we we are actually saw the 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 the, the acclimation right after the cold events. That's super puzzling me here. And uh, later on, actually, they reacclimate later. So it's like why? So. But uh, for for growers, that probably wouldn't be any useful no. uh, information at all. Yeah. No, it's too late. Yeah, um, Carl is asking: Given the two cold events affecting two consecutive harvests, should we reconsider practices of hilling and dehilling to protect graft unions and sensitive scions? This year, we did not have enough snow cover to protect all graft un unions. Yeah, but at least, of course, that's a gamble, right? And most of the years, we don't really get a cold snap. And uh, just like uh, the, uh, the historical data shows, and uh, it's really hard to predict if that will happen or not. Yeah, I, of course, I hope uh, we wouldn't see similar event happen again in the next 40, 50 years. Yeah, that's what we knows. said last year, though, right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> How about mulch? Have you have you um, have you tested mulch? Uh, mulch. Mm. I personally haven't tested, but I think uh, Pat she did a maybe similar experiment before. But I think the the mulch somehow actually. Uh, make the make the the where being covered actually less uh cold hardy right yes. so there's like actually detrimental effects over there 
So probably you have to keep the mulch really dry to keep that protection. If the mulch is wet, probably defeated the protection effects. That could be what uh, what they saw there. Ben Min, what was what was the wind like those those two nights? I pretty uh, there was a wind and a pretty constant wind direction from west to east. So for us, that will be kind of like a, uh, the wind is blowing from Summerland to Naramala. Mm -hmm. So that was the last year, actually, the wind direction helped. I think it helped the Naramala a little bit. Mm -hmm. it, the, the leg actually won on the air. But this year, the same direction, just because the, the Summerland temperature was just too cold, even though that was a, still plus uh, maybe two or three degrees Celsius. When they when the cold air reached to uh, Naramana, the the temperature still cannot be below twenty two. Yeah. Right. I I mean the the lake was substant substantially colder this year as well. I mean because last year was early December or mid December, and you know temperatures had been pretty mild, right? So, right. Yeah. So re regarding the mulch, Thierry says uh, we. We have U of M varietals and have successfully protected to minus 32, I'm assuming. Oh, you know, oh Minnesota, guys. Mm. Oh. Yeah, that's uh, somewhere I want to maybe work with them in the future. <laughs> yeah, those are those are actually hybrids. And uh, the, they're basically marketing them as a really cool hard yeah. varieties. So um, how I about believe that's a degree they can do. Yeah. How about wind machines? Wind machines. Uh, wind machine over here actually would like to access any. I know Environment Canada, they have a sensors over like a nine meter height. So if you're seeing there is a warm air, I think a wind machine should help. Right. But to which degree, that's we don't really know. Yeah. We kind of like the data about the higher up temperature. Right. I'm I'm assuming that there were uh, that the wind machines were running on wherever they could and has right just does, uh, as a guarantee like a something we're doing might help and you know, we do it so, yeah right. yeah um all right we still have ten minutes so. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, Benman will will postpone your your presentation okay. yeah, um, and so um, I think I think probably we can do it March. Um, Kate will confirm that okay. um, because yeah I think didn't you say you had how, how like did you say it was a forty minute presentation so uh, yeah. We'll give it time. yeah I can do about thirty the the rest of okay. the content. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, and but Kate was pointing out that um, there, there's obviously consideration um, in terms of um, virus, uh, virus replanting and that sort of thing. If there is going to be replanting going on, so um, the you know the virus question is is still hot. Um, yeah. So. And also, yeah, Kate is uh, put in the chat that this this video is going to be on our um, our website and the the South Okanagan Facebook page nice. later today. Um, she's also going to uh, send out a, a post with the the links to the previous two talks that we had last last year, yours and Marcus Keller's. Marcus. Okay. Um, and I haven't heard any um, data from Washington from the, this last event. Have you? Uh, they are not really concerned about the uh, cold damage. Looks like uh, they're over still in a safe zone. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm sure that's going to come up in the next little while. Okay. Um, Question. Yeah, Kate is also saying for those of you who are on the call that might not be um, on our wine, our wine grape council R and D committee mailing list, um, send her send her an email and she'll um, make sure you're you're getting emails directly. 
I think there's there are probably a lot of people on the call that aren't on that list. The R and D committee is open to any industry member um, who um, would like to help determine the direction for research in the future. Um, so yeah, just pop that off to her. Okay. Oh, uh, Carl, will there be any further testing given today's release data? Further. Uh, I, mean, I will keep doing that uh, regular DTA test. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, is there, can you do any more um, like trunk testing or like you, you mentioned that really we just have to wait till blood break? Uh, yeah, the trunk, you can actually do trunk back section and uh, basically study uh, how bad the trunk was damaged. But uh, I know most of people don't like do it because you basically open a wound and yeah. invite a certain pathogen to intrude there, right? And also now the temperature is still too cold. We're still below freezing point, even though you cut them up right now, you wouldn't see any color change, right? Right. They need to take time and a temperature to develop a color. So right now, still not a good time to do it. No. Do you plan to do more like next week when the temperatures rise? Uh, but but dissect dissection. Oh, I the oh the strong one. Yeah. Mm, I I myself probably will do those two our own <laughs> own vines, <laughs> like where I don't really worry I about my children. <laughs> I know. I know. Like, how old are those vines at the research station? The Merlot vines. The Merlot, they some of them are pretty old. Yeah, I. But uh, those are like a, we uh, inherit them from our soil, uh, soil scientist. So right. like uh, from Denise and uh, Jerry's era. So that oh. was <laughs> from long ago. Well, what study were they planted for? For a soil study or? Yeah, there was a soil study plot, and uh, they bury something down there. I forgot what's the material, but the, yeah, they're still there. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Thierry um, is also asking, have you tried different training approaches with Vetus, such as UNIFIN? Mm -mm, I basically only using a uh, SPUR, BSP type. I try to sprawl, like basically don't put them in the, in the, in the catching wire, but that's for testing something else. Right. And I don't think the, the training system will really impact uh, cold hardness. Well, unless if you use the training system control internals, then it's maybe, yeah. Right, right. I know in in um, Vermont they train along the ground, right? So that yeah, yeah, so they have a chance to yeah cover them really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is. But the overall question still, uh, <laughs> what's the frequency this kind of event will be? It, yeah. it, it's high in Vermont. But yeah. yeah, yeah. I wonder if we can actually invite a meteorologist talks about the frequency. Right. I think that'll be helpful. Right. I, well, if you have someone at the station that does modeling, right? Uh, Nathaniel, maybe, maybe he's the one. Or, uh, or Kirsten. Yeah, well, yeah, if you if you come up with someone. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll ask them about, like, hey. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's also been suggested that it would be great to have an industry town hall type meeting to exchange um, experiences and get an idea of, you know, what's going on out there. And so um, uh, stay tuned. You, um, the Wine Grape Council might organize something like that. So um, you'll receive info from Kate on that if that happens. And um, thanks thanks so much, Benman, for um, so quickly um, giving us this presentation and providing the information, because I know I, 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 everybody's got a lot of questions and I think you've been really helpful, as well as just the work that you've been doing all, all along. 
Uh, yeah, I actually went to the uh, associations uh, there pruning workshop on Tuesday. Yeah. So I already know what kind of people, people, uh, what kind of content people is going to ask. Right. <laughs> yeah. And the questions people have. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. On a last point, Hans is saying, if you're replanting, you should insist on certified. Yes, that's very important. I mean, we really don't need to be getting together in a few years and talking about the disaster of viruses, right? So, so yeah, let's keep that in mind. Um, okay, I'll um, I'll be in, in touch. Um, our talk, our planned talk uh, for next month is um, around uh, root stocks. Um, Kate will send that information out. Mom, you know soon. <laughs> You'll hear about that. And we'll see you again in a couple of months, Ben Min. Yeah. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. And um, I'm, I wish, wish we weren't having this conversation, but um, let's work together to. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Bye. you everyone for the information. Thanks for coming, Ben Min. Thank you everybody. Thank you.